Hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome to WIDS uh, 2020 Mumbai edition. And we are very happy to welcome you to the online YouTube series. Uh, today, as you all might have known, and we are very happy to welcome you to the, as you might have all uh, seen our posters, that uh, we are having a very special guest with us, Madhavi Kandalam, who is the chief uh, data scientist in loyalty rewards. Uh, just before we move into her talk, uh, I would like to begin with uh, a slight introduction on what is WIDS and uh, uh, how Stanford had hosted WIDS uh, around March 2nd or 3rd. So I'll just share my screen and let's just I'm to show you a video. Data science and any data inspired and data driven science is so critical right now. More and more decisions are made based on data. The amount of data that we gather every day and the insights that data can provide us is just growing exponentially and that is no exaggeration. The market for data science and related areas like AI is booming. It is so important to have women in artificial intelligence in the area of data science and also in leadership roles. It's being able to use data to solve issues and understand bigger problems, it's critical. And we need women in these roles. Every individual brings their own perspective, and so we need to make sure the entire workforce is represented. And the good news is there's so many jobs and many different ways to combine their passion area and their skills in data science and get involved. I would like you to say, what are the problems in the world that absolutely have to be changed? And, you know, can you individually, given all the amazing background that you've had so far and all the education that you've got so far, what are the unique things that you can do to change the world towards that mission? And then think of the technology. If that is going to become completely data-driven over time, then you can't miss that opportunity. You've got to join in and, 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 and have your say. If you're not looking at the data from all sorts of different angles, then you could introduce a lot of bias. So it's really, really important that we have around the table all genders, uh, all races, all backgrounds. We can't ignore social and structural problems. We can't just go in a, in a corner and write some code and read math and then we're open. That's, that's the solution, right? We can't do that. So we have to think about who is being affected by these algorithms. Welcome to WIN! <laughs> when we first started this conference, we never would have imagined that we'd be sitting here today with over 200 regional events. We've got over 500 WIS ambassadors worldwide. Many of them are women, but we've also got a lot of men. And these are people who are just passionate about inspiring others within their community. We're in over 60 countries. And year after year, we're blown away. Let's make this next decade, the women in the data science uh, decade. What I love about it is that that growth is viral. No, people will attend one event in one city and then they'll want to bring it to their cohort or colleagues the next year. This type of industry can be done everywhere, so it should be accessible to everybody. And this is one of the reasons why I love that we are global with this. So we wanted to create opportunities for women to inspire, educate, and support women at many different times throughout the year. And one way that we decided we could do that was through a datathon every year, which is a predictive analytics challenge using real world data. We have over 900 teams from 85 countries, and that's in every continent except Antarctica. When we started WITS in 2015, we had no idea this was going to be a global movement with tons of international events and a data-thon and a podcast show and, and now outreach to middle school and high school has just been such a ride. Our latest endeavor is to work on some materials that we can hand off to teachers in schools around the world. This has provided a platform for literally hundreds of women, if not thousands of women, 
to have an opportunity to be heard. But the truth is, these are really a couple of terms, but they have profound impact because they empower someone else to be able to do their job better or to be able to take that message. Five years ago, when we were sitting around a coffee table, thinking about what WIBS could be, I never in my wildest dreams thought it would grow so far and so wide around the world in just five years. What I'm most excited about is the next five years, because I think this is really just the start. So that was um, a very wonderful uh, shift from what it is it's expecting. Or is that Do you know what skills it takes to, to be successful? Uh, achieve through this entire uh, initiative. And I would like to also mention that one of the main reasons you actually uh, started this uh, this initiative is so that we very often most of us who actually visit uh, you know who attend a lot of conferences, tech conferences, uh, data science conferences, we we hardly find women on the speaker panel. So what happens is what what which is actually trying to bring is like the bring to the light is there are a lot of women in the in this field. AI and data science is being uh, there, I think, even 20 years before the, this entire buzzword began. And we are trying to provide a platform for our uh, women to come forward and, sh and share what work they've been doing. In. And we're, we're really sure that, uh, that there is definitely, there are so many, so many women. And we try to get grab hold of our Mumbai superstars every year. This is the third year we're doing this and uh, we are really glad to uh, once again welcome Madhavi who is our uh, speaker for today and uh, for if I were to give an introduction I think I, I will short follow words because she has more than 10 years of experience in this data science domain. She's been working uh, with loyalty rewards for I think six years now and before that with New Sigma. Complete, uh, I mean Anything and everything related to analytics, she might have had a hand on it already, if not more. And I think uh, what I like most about her uh, journey is that when everybody has been doing so many uh, certifications on deep learning AI and this and that, there's so many certifications and everything so well, Madhuri has done her work like hands on, just got her hands dirty on so many projects that has helped her reach a career, I mean, at the stage that she is at her career right now. So without any further ado, I would like to just uh, welcome Adi to take the session over. Adi. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for the kind words, Julian, and for the fantastic uh, inspirational video. I'm uh, very excited to be collaborating with the Women in Data Science Initiative, something which I deeply, strongly believe in for the second year in a row. I've also been a part of Women in Data Science Conference last year, and this is the second time I'm collaborating with them. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. And uh, I'm very excited to see participation of so many women in this field. We at Loyalty Rewards have actively tried to work on increasing the gender ratio in our department, and we have succeeded to a considerable extent, though there is still a long uh, way to be covered. When I started, uh, a couple of years back in this role, I think I was pretty much the only uh, only women in my team. Uh, ever since then, we've actively tried to recruit more women into our team. And now uh, we have at least 30-35% uh, women in our 25-member team. So that's still not 50, but uh, it's, it, but it, I mean, there's still a long way to go. But I think it's still a significant accomplishment, which is very dear to me. And uh, uh, like uh, Julian said, I have worked at uh, Mu Sigma and at Loyalty Rewards. I would uh, be moving on to do my MBA at London Business School this year. I am interested in the field of AI because it's been my passion since nine years. And uh, I'd like to explore uh, new startups and new businesses uh, where AI can be leveraged to create significant social impact. That's my area of interest. So that's a brief introduction about me. And I am also a twin mom. The reason why I'm saying this is uh, despite the best of my uh, precautionary measures, in case my twins show up on this video, please um, please pardon, pardon that. 
so without any further ado uh, further ado i would just start off with the session today i understand that the audience must be coming from different kind of background so i've tried to uh, cover as many basic concepts as possible as we go through in this session uh, and uh, depending on how much uh, time we have i will try to give a mathematical overview of the model as well so uh, I, I would like to try and keep a few minutes to answer questions towards the end. We can start. Uh, let me just share my uh, screen. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about XGPost. Uh, I understand that it's not possible to cover entire mathematical detail or uh, do live coding within the time constraints that we have. Uh, so the way I have approached this session is to introduce different concepts related to machine learning, which are generally used across models before we get to details of XGBoost. I'll first start with, uh, yeah. So, uh, I, I uh, sorry. I just want to make a quick check. Uh, Julian, you can sh you can see my screen, right? Yeah, I can see it on the screen. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, I think you must have been uh, you must have heard about this whole rivalry between statistical versus machine learning models. Uh, there there are two groups. Uh, so. There, so a lot of the statistical models go way back, and they're based on concepts related to p-value, confident in, confidence intervals, and likelihood functions. Um, and they normally assume a certain kind of distribution on the errors or residuals. So uh, Bremen has introduced the concept of algorithmic modeling. The reason why we had to move on to algorithmic modeling from the statistical models which were existing was because the statistical models were inadequate to explain complicated, uh, were, were inadequate to explain uh, complicated data sets. And uh, if intuitively you think, think about it, the nature, uh, in Bremen's words, the, the data existing in nature, the relationship between variables and the response in nature is a black box. So you can't just reduce it to some this, uh, some assumption based on the distribution of variables or residuals like statistical models do and try to explain a black box. Uh, people used to prefer statistical models before because they are more interpretable, like uh, logistic regression is extremely interpretable, like uh, people would love to look at the simulations of the odds ratio, how the response probability is changing with respect to incremental change in the coefficients. Yeah, I mean, I understand that they're very interpretable, but um, they're not as accurate. So there are a lot of constraints with statistical models and the world moved on to algorithmic modeling, as it was called at the time, which we now refer to as machine learning. So when it started, there are two popular approaches, uh, tree-based models. Uh, great, XGBoost is a tree-based model. And the second one is neural networks. Uh, neural networks, interestingly, go way back in time, actually. Uh, and when they were introduced, there, were, there was a lot of excitement that this is the it model. And you know, this is going to solve for everything. But uh, like we have seen in machine learning, nothing solves for everything. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, as a lot of experimentation was done, they've realized that neural networks don't work as well. And they're not able to give as accurate results as they wanted, as they were expecting, that, uh, or they, as they were hoping that neural networks would give. So they were abandoned for a brief period of time. And there was a lot of excitement in the tree-based models. Uh, there was a lot of excitement in research related to tree-based models. And uh, of course, we all know that there are a lot of there have been a lot of recent research improvements which have uh, made neural networks uh, much more, which have enhanced neural networks much more, and uh, they form the basis of what we call as deep learning today. So I'll tell you why that uh, why that disconnect has happened. Basically, neural networks work well when you have homogeneous entities of data. So they're fantastic for images. Today, we have the computational power to actually run models on images and do image processing. So they work fantastic for data like images. What I mean by that is, in an image, one pixel is comparable to another. 
But if you look at tabular data, which is most transactional data, which most organizations have, for example, spend and number of transactions or spend and number of categories in which a customer has transacted are fundamentally different variables. They are not homogeneous entities. And neural networks are actually not designed to work well with that kind of a data. The reason why there was a drop in interest in neural networks and it again peaked was because people were trying to apply it on tabular data and realizing that the results were not as good. So that's a brief history. And uh, tree-based models uh, were more popular uh, when they were introduced because uh, they were introduced at a time when neural networks were thought to be not working effectively. And uh, even today, the boosted tree algorithms are extremely popular for tabular data. Uh, there's nothing like XGBoost, which has won uh, most Kegel competitions. It's, it's one of the most popular algorithms in Kegel competitions, and it has won most of them uh, wherever the data involved has been tabular. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's still one of the most powerful, uh, powerful algorithms out there for tabular data, uh, which is uh, most transactional data we have is tabular data, like I said. So... Uh, First, when they were introduced, we, people were working with single trees. Single trees are nothing but your basic decision trees like uh, cart, classification, and regression tree. They are extremely interpretable, but they're not very accurate. Like, I mean, a cart, the diagram is extremely interpretable. Basically, business people look for models which are very interpretable. They would like to know what is the impact of one variable on the response outcome. Whereas uh, the complicated models like neural networks, uh, neural network is a black box. It's very difficult to like figure out, uh, backtrace what is happening inside if you want to understand why uh, the model has predicted, uh, has given a certain prediction. The same thing holds true even for ensemble techniques. Ensemble is a combination of multiple trees. Uh, because see, single tree is easy to understand, right? Like, But when you are combining multiple trees to arrive at an output, obviously it's far less interpretable. So uh, even though they improve the accuracy uh, significantly, ensemble techniques increase the accuracy of tree-based techniques significantly, and hence there have been a big hit ever since uh, random forest and uh, gradient boosted trees and then XG boost have been introduced. They're still very popular for predicting customer response in the loyalty industry, for example, uh, or uh, spam, non-spam no, non classification. They're still very popular for most of the classification problems which we have with tabular data today. And uh, with that introduction, I'm just going to explain, I'm just going to give a ba very basic uh, structural overview of how a predictive model problem is formulated because um, uh, I, I understand that uh, audience could be coming from different backgrounds. So what's a basic predictive model problem statement mathematically? If you have n observations, observations is the data which you have. Each row in data is an observation. You're trying to find a general function. I'll explain what I'm, what we mean by general function in the coming slide uh, using feature vector x. Feature vector x is nothing but combination of all the individual uh, predictor variables or uh, features, if you'd like to call them. Uh, m could be the number of features. And you're trying to predict the response variable y. Response variable y could take the form of a continuous variable, like for example, sales uh, occurring on a given day. It's a continuous variable uh, with some limitations on the range, but yeah, essentially continuous in that range. Or uh, it could be a categorical variable. Categorical, categorical variable is uh, nothing but a binary or a multinomial variable, like it could take values uh, one or zero. It could be a flag, which is one minus one or one zero, or it could also be a multi-class variable which could take multiple nominal values, basically. For example, whether a customer is going to accept my offer or not, if I'm predicting, if I'm trying to identify the target audience for a particular offer, my response variable could be whether or not the customer is going to accept an offer. And yeah, coming to the general function part, um, why, so why is this error component involved? The error component makes this whole modeling problem a probabilistic model or a stochastic model. We are not trying to solve for a deterministic model. Yeah. So what I mean by that is, for example, if you take one particular feature x, just one feature, think about it. If I have n observations with uh, 
n values for y, I could always fit a perfect po for polynomial of n minus 1 degrees for any two continuous variables, like for any one continuous feature x and for any one continuous variable y, I could always fit a perfect polynomial of the n minus 1 degree. We all know how many equations are required to solve for an n minus 1 degree polynomial. You need n equations. Then why don't we do it? Why use multiple features? Why make it a probabilistic model? This is giving a basic intuition about the concept of training and test and what is observed and what is not observed. Because we want our model, what, what we are essentially saying is we are building a model on data which we have observed. But we want our model to work even on data which we have not observed. The idea is that we use, we build this using the data we have observed to actually make predictions about something we, for which we don't have the answers for. That's the intuition behind the concepts of overfitting. Like, I mean, you must have heard of the term overfitting. So basically doing this uh, n minus one degree polynomial would be overfitting to the extreme. So that's why we don't do it, because such a model will not work on any other observation outside of this data set. It will not work on new data. So you want to make, build a general model. That's what the general model statement meant in the earlier slide. Uh, and typically, observations are divided into training and test or based on random sampling. And uh, errors are checked in for both. Uh, uh, you have to measure the errors in both training and test. So if your model is uh, good, the error in training and test should sort of be similar. Uh, yeah, they should sort of be similar. If the training error is very low and the test error is very high, uh, that means you have overfit the model. Uh, and if the training error and test error both are very high, that means you have uh, underfit the model. So I'm just going to now pose supervised learning as an optimization problem. Um, if I have to explain in very non-technical terms, what actually supervised learning is, um, you have to give an exam. You have the answer, but, but you already have some model papers. Depending on this, now you're going to write answer to, to the questions uh, asked in the exam. That's supervised learning. So you have answers known to certain questions before. Fundamentally, responses for some observations are known. Uh, unsupervised learning is different where responses are not known beforehand. Uh, so that's more like you're reading a textbook and you're creating a summary out of it. Um, for example, if you're looking at clustering, I mean, you're trying to uh, divide data into basic, uh, into broad groups without actually uh, having any knowledge of response beforehand. Uh, there's no concept of response in unsupervised learning. So uh, I'm just posing this, uh, posing this as an optimization problem. So optimization forms the fundamental uh, fundamental concept behind most of the machine learning algorithms today. The, uh, they, they use optimization-related approaches. Uh, so, so if you have uh, if you have to predict outputs y for n records and you have inputs x, which is a feature vector, or say single feature, you have to define some loss. Basically, what we are trying to do is we are trying to we are trying to build a model which will uh, which will give output which is as close to the original output as possible without overfitting. So the loss could be some form of uh, difference between the predicted value versus the actual uh, actual value. So optimization is basically uh, minimizing the loss. It's unconstrained optimization. You just have to find the local minima. So L is the loss function. Uh, you're going to express loss function as a function of Y and P. And it in turn becomes F of X because your predicted value is a function of X. Uh, mean square error is a classic example of loss functions, uh, a loss function which is used in uh, continuous variables. It's the square difference, sum of square difference between uh, actual and uh, predicted values across the data set. Yeah, so uh, one more thing to note is uh, loss functions are defined in such a way that they have to be concave because only concave functions will have a minima. Uh, 
functions which are convex like uh, if a function goes the opposite way uh, there i mean it's it's not possible to converge at a minima so these are the different forms of loss functions one is mean, mean squared error other is log loss which is defined in case of uh, binomial variables or flag variables uh, cross entropy in case of multi class variables um, adaboost uses exponential loss svm uses hinge loss so there are different forms in which loss functions can be defined and you could also do something interesting where you could weight the loss function in such a way that uh, you could actually incorporate uh, the loss to the business uh, for each kind of misclassification into defining the loss function for example uh, if i'm trying to categorize for customers uh, who need to be sent an offer uh, if there is a way in which you could measure uh, what would be the loss if you miss out on sending to a potential customer versus what is the loss in uh, sending out to the wrong customer uh, you could incorporate that information into defining the loss function as well and weight it out that way uh next concept is related to bias variance trade off uh, this is very important to understand the concepts of uh, bagging and boosting so if you take one look at this picture you sh you it, it would explain everything so bias is the difference between the prediction and the actual value which we are trying to predict so if there is a very high bias it means you have not you have not used the information which you have to build the model properly so in some sense you have underfit the model that's high bias variance happens when your model is uh, tending to give a lot of uh, unstable outputs there is a lot of uh, variability in the outputs which are which are thrown depending on uh, new data which you are feeding into the model so what is happening is your training error may be less but the test data error is going to be very high so if the variance is high it means you have overfit the model which is why it's not working very well on test data uh th this th this is a bull's eye overview of bias variance trade off now i'm going to move on to regularization <laughs> um so uh, i have explained before that uh, we are not supposed to overfit our models and supervised learning can be posed as an optimization problem on the loss function what regularization does is in order to prevent overfitting basically uh, you don't want to arrive at a model which is too complicated because generally too complicated model uh, too complicated models uh, tend to be overfitted to the data so you're going to penalize for how complex the model is that's basically the concept of regularization so instead of minimizing the actual loss function you would add a penalty term to it there are two kinds of uh, popular uh, regularization methods uh, l1 uh, lasso is same laplace is also same in case there's a confusion they all correspond to the same thing so in this the sum of absolute model coefficients are added to the loss function uh, whereas in case of l2 uh, ridge and gaussian also correspond to the same the sum of squares of coefficients are added to the loss function uh, we don't have to get into the math of it uh, but uh, it would suffice to know that what l1 does is it creates sparse features uh, so it eliminates some features altogether so it it inherently uh, can be used for feature selection as well so whereas in case of l2 uh it doesn't eliminate the features altogether but it lowers a lot of coefficients to near zero so l2 will try to uh l2 will give you a model with uh, a lot of uh, low value coefficients uh a general tendency whereas l1 will uh, tend to give a model where you have high coefficients of but uh, lesser number of features so uh i'll just mention here that the same concept uh lasso can be applied at a tree level if you really think about one tree as uh, 
some function or variable of sorts. Uh, in all these ensemble methods, uh, L1 is applied to reduce the number of trees which you are going to use to build the final model. Uh, it's good for production also because uh, you don't want to like uh, keep the code for 500, teeth, 500 trees. Uh, I can touch upon that later. Uh, so uh, this is what a basic decision tree looks like. Uh, it's extremely interpretable, like I said. Um, this is called a leaf node because there are no further splits here. Um, we are trying to predict the response as yes, no to something, depending on different uh, parameters like uh, age, height, uh, weight, income, etc. Uh, we are trying to predict a certain response variable. Uh, so in decision tree, this is called a leaf node because there's no further split below this. And uh, this is called a split node because there are further splits below this. I mean, this is further split into more nodes. So uh, this is how a decision tree looks like. Uh, depending on each variable, you're going to split the data set and predict a response for each node. Uh, while this is extremely interpretable, unless uh, you're going to have like a very uh, deep tree with a lot of nodes, then that would, I guess, become very complicated to interpret. So there is going to be penalty on the depth of trees. Generally, uh, th th there would be some kind of a constraint on the depth of trees. Uh, and uh, intuitively, if you think about it, uh, without uh, having to think anything about machine learning, if you want to like... Um, if you want to like stop splitting, uh, you would probably put a criteria saying, um, I at least, uh, I mean, I don't want to have uh, uh, less than X observations in a particular uh, node. I mean, I don't want to like have two small nodes. That is one intuitive way of putting a constraint on splitting the nodes. And another way is uh, you probably want to put a constraint saying, uh, if there's no point in uh, splitting it further, for example, uh, if I'm going to split this further, if I'm not going to let it get a lot of difference between the, the two uh, child nodes in terms of uh, accuracy, then I would probably, I mean, if there's no improvement in terms of accuracy, then I would probably want to stop splitting. So that's another intuitive way of looking at it. That's the basic decision tree. Uh, like I said, while it's highly interpretable, it's not uh, very accurate uh, on complicated data. So ensemble techniques are used to improve the performance of decision tree. Ensemble is a collection of trees, like I said, and they give dramatically better results than a single tree. So there are two, uh, there are two basic ways of uh, creating ensembles. Uh, all the all, uh, uh, random forest, uh, all the gradient boosted trees are fancier versions uh, using a combination of these two. So first is bagging. Bagging is nothing but uh, bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is uh, dividing the population into multiple. It's not dividing, picking multiple random samples from the population. It's sampling without replacement. So you're going to, I mean, there could be some overlap in terms of observations between multiple samples which you've picked up because it's sampling without replacement. But it doesn't, it shouldn't matter as much if you're having a reasonable uh, size of data to work with. So it's basically random sampling without replacement. So instead of building one tree, we are going to build like uh, multiple trees on multiple random samples and uh, use a combination of those outputs to arrive at the predicted response. Uh, fundamentally, what bagging does is it reduces variance by averaging outputs, so you would get a more stable result. Uh, you're basically averaging outputs across multiple trees. So it's something like um, um, audience poll in KBC. Uh, I would ask everyone what they think the answer is, and I would go with the most popular answer. So for a classification problem, how do you finally assign the final predicted value? You would go with, uh, you would go with uh, the highest occurrences. Like uh, uh, Because there are multiple trees, it's possible that one tree would predict the response as 0 and another as 1. You would just go with, uh, you just go with the highest number of responses across trees to predict for a particular observation. Uh, boosting is uh, also about building multiple trees, but uh, these trees are built iteratively. 
so uh, it's uh, it, uh, when it was first introduced it it was uh, it was a game changer because it gave dramatically improved results in terms of accuracy so what you're going to do is you're going to start building you will start with one more, one tree and you will take the residuals and again learn from the residuals and again you will take the residuals so you're, you're basically trying to learn from the errors the mistakes you have made in the previous model so this uh, helps buyers this helps reduce bias drastically because you're trying to learn incrementally from incrementally more from data the reason why uh, uh, th these methods th the reason why uh, boosting works so well for a lot of data which we have the reason why the enhanced versions of boosting algorithms work so well uh, for uh, predictive accuracy is because a lot of times our data is sparse for example any transactional data which we talk about uh, uh, the 8020 rule applies so most of your customers would have done only one transaction or two three transactions so you don't have a lot of information about those customers to learn from them so your features are going to be sparse uh, what I mean by that is uh, they're going to you, you will not have values for a lot of features for a lot of customers. Because boosting does this iterative incremental learning, it works very well by learning from sparse data. That's the reason why it's so popular for tabular data. So now I'll just come to random forest. It's a fancier version of uh, bagging, like I said. So it's basically bootstrapping. Uh, there's one more change which is introduced, which is, um, yeah, which is this M random features. So along with uh, randomly choosing the observations on which you're going to build the tree, you're also going to randomly choose the features. So what it does is it decorrelates the trees by choosing subset features and obviously lower the m or uh, better the decorrelation is going to be um i mean if, if m is sorry I, i'm sorry about skipping this yeah i'm going back yeah so uh lower the m better the decorrelation is going to be very intuitively because uh, as m tends to be uh nearing the actual number of features which you have then uh, there is going to be a lot of overlap again across trees and uh, all trees are given equal weights m is the tuning parameter uh, even XGBoost includes column subsampling, unlike the other uh, gradient boosting uh, uh, algorithms. So, which is why uh, it, it's uh, it works better than the other ones. Uh, typically, M is taken as square root of uh, P, where P is the total number of features that you have. Yeah, uh, and one more point which I would like to make, uh, which is interesting about random forest, is uh, uh, if you have a lot of interaction, if you have a very complicated data set with a lot of variables and uh, there's no there's no easy connection across variable between variables and the response, uh, you will need uh, your base tree in a random forest to have more nodes. You'll need deeper trees because uh, random forest intuitively doesn't have any mechanism to reduce the bias so you have to have a uh, you have to have the base learner to be strong and good so you would probably need like more uh, nodes in the tree whereas uh, in case of boosting if you're going to go deep uh, you would tend to overfit so shallow trees work better than boosting because you're anyway going to again learn incrementally from the new data you're anyway going to incrementally learn uh, in the new tree, in the new iteration which you're going to do. So uh, it's better to not overfit in one go. So shallow trees are better for boosting. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about general boosting models now. So like I said, uh, the concept of boosting is uh, to build a model on residuals to learn from errors and improve with each iteration. Excuse me. So uh, you could formulate it this way. Each additive model uh, is made of component residuals. So at teeth iteration, teeth iteration is going to be uh, 
uh, the prediction at t titration is going to be an addition of prediction prediction at t minus one titration and f of x. So you have to really solve for f of x. Generally, f of x is solved for uh, using gradient based methods. That's why it's called gradient boosting. So uh, this the, uh, this was the uh, this was how the original gradient boosting algorithm was formulated. So enhanced versions today generally uh, also uh, use a combination of bagging as well, which is uh, you use bootstrap data sets again at each iteration instead of the entire data. And uh, it's important to note that there is no backfitting. Uh, so you're going to do stage-wise fitting. So you will not uh, adjust the, you will not go back and adjust the weights for t minus one iterations again. So you're only going to do forward fitting. That will, uh, that kind of takes care of uh, avoiding overfitting and overfitting and boosting. I mean, it tends to slow down the rate at which you would come close to fitting the noise. Uh, you have to be very careful with boost uh, boosting techniques because uh, uh, with repeated iterations, they do tend to fit the noise also. So it's it's actually very important in case of uh, uh, in case of all the boosting techniques to do cross validation and uh, check out of time frame, out of bag errors and stuff like that. The validation is very important uh, because there is a tendency to overfit. So you have to look at out of train errors. So. There is one more nuance here. Uh, in the same boosting model, we are going to introduce a shrinkage parameter. It's something like a regularization parameter. Uh, so you're going to, instead of adding the actual f of x here, you're going to uh, multiply it with a shrinkage parameter. I think you must have heard the term uh, boosting, uh, additive boosting is a combination of a lot of weak learners. So basically, you're going to weaken the coefficient. Instead of adding the entire value, you're going to weaken the f of x here. You're going to weaken the coefficients through the shrinkage parameter. Uh, and again, build a new tree at the next iteration so that you would get a whole new tree and you would be able to learn more. So it this, this uh, parameter also kind of takes care of uh, overfitting and boosting. And it's uh, you can interpret it as some sort of regularization parameter. Yeah, so like I mentioned, boosting by definition tends to overfit. So it's very important to do out of bag and uh, out of time frame validations to test the model. Uh, make sure that you look at the test error uh, on multiple data sets. Uh, intuitively, if you think about it, these are the various kind of tuning parameters in boosting, like uh, for each tree, uh, how, at how many nodes are you going to stop? Um, what is the depth of trees? Like, uh, how deep do you want to go? Uh, like I said before, it, it's not recommended to uh, go for very deep trees. Uh, shallow trees are better. Um, uh, and also, shrinkage is a tuning parameter. So now I'm going to come to XG. Uh, sorry. I'm going to talk about XG Boost and why it is an improvement over the traditional other gradient boosting algorithms. Firstly, uh, XGBoost introduces the, an L1 and L2 regularization penalties for each iteration again. For each of the trees, the way each tree is built, again, the coefficients are penalized. And there's an overall reduction in the number of trees by the L1 regularization. So that's a salient feature of XGBoost. So there are two levels of regularization which are happening. One is the L2 penalty for the coefficients within each tree, which is built at each iteration. The second is uh, the L1, uh, the L1 regularization component, um, which is introduced to reduce the overall number of trees used in the final model. So that's a clever penalization of trees, and this is uh, the second salient feature is a proportional shrinking of leaf nodes. So uh, what, what, what that means is uh, there would be some nodes where the predictions are actually good. The, and you would call it the evidence. The evidence is good. I mean, the incremental improvement is good. 
So there, XG boost will not shrink the coefficients too much. So those nodes will carry more weight as compared to the other nodes. So that is the second salient feature of XG boost, which is why it makes very good use of sparse data. And the third uh, salient feature, I will explain about this a little bit more in detail later on, is it uses the Newton method of, for uh, optimization instead of gradient descent. So uh, fundamentally, Newton method also uses the Hessian, which is uh, the uh, gradient of gradient. Uh, I'll explain about it later. But yeah, I mean, it uses, it uses more information, and it's computationally uh, less expensive. So that's the advantage of Newton method. And uh, it also introduces this extra randomization parameter. I, I mentioned to you, it does this column subsampling. So it also chooses a random set of columns to build each tree like random forest does. So those are the salient features of uh, XGBoost. Um, now uh, I'll just give a quick overview of uh, the math behind the Newton method. In the interest of time, uh, I'll st stop after that and take questions. Uh, let me share another uh, PDF with you. Yeah, so I'm taking this PDF from uh, one of my ex-managers. Uh, He's currently the head of uh, data science at Poshmark. Um, he has generously agreed to let me use uh, his slides. So uh, I'm going to skip a lot of these in the interest of time. We've already covered these, uh, but I like, well, like I said, to repeat, boosting is a process of combining many weak models to create a single model. The power of boosting, uh, intuitively, when you think about it, how can so many weak models uh, combine and build a very strong model? That's because you're iteratively learning at each step from the errors. So th that's the power of boosting. And you're also not, uh, the reason why you're reducing each individual model to weak model is to ensure that you're not overfitting. Yeah, so. This is the unconstrained, basic uh, unconstrained optimization uh, where you're trying to find x such that uh, f of x is minimum. And there are two types of minima. This is uh, not very important. But normally, most of the uh, optimization techniques we use, they give you the local minima, not the global minima. For example, if your curve has uh, two, uh, if your curve has two dips, uh, you would be taken to the local dip, which is closest to the point from where you have started. Yeah. So a gradient direction, uh, this is based on the gradient descent algorithm, where uh, with each step, you are trying to move in the direction of the gradient. There are fantastic explanations available for this. So I will not spend a lot of time explaining about gradient descent algorithm over here. Uh, but very quickly, uh, it's basically uh, you have to move uh, in the negative direction of the gradient at each step. And alpha is the learning rate and uh, or uh, step size. And uh, that's generally not straightforward to calculate. Uh, there are special methods available to solve for it. Uh, I mean, uh, so... Uh, just, just to uh, just to give a, a quick uh, idea, the gradient of a curve at any point, which is the dou f by dou x, um, which is the first degree differential, uh, it gives the point. It, it gives it gives the steepest ascent. But we are trying to find the minima, so you have to go in the reverse direction. That's why it's called gradient descent. So you're going to go. You're going to uh, move in the direction of negative gradient. Negative gradient over here. Yeah, so now I'm going to talk about the Newton method, which is used in uh, XGBoost. So this is nothing but the Taylor's expansion. Uh, Taylor's expansion can be used to express a function as uh, sum of uh, infinite number of uh, derivatives of the function at that point. When d is reasonably small, uh, the higher order terms are almost negligible. So you can just approximate it to just the second degree. Uh, you can just approximate it to be a combination of these three. It's this term, which is called the Hessian, 
uh, which uh, which is used in uh, HG boost or in the Newton method, which makes it like so much uh, powerful compared to the other gradient based optimization techniques. Uh, the only challenge with this is you have to choose the loss function in such a way that uh, h of x, which is called the Hessian, which is dou square f by dou x square, has to be positive definite uh, so that, so that uh, you actually converge at a solution. So this is the direction in which you need to go. Instead of uh, in gradient descent, if you remember, you're going in the direction of minus alpha into uh, dou f by dou x. Here you're going to go in the direction of minus h inverse of x into g of x. So the main uh, advantage of this method is no step size calculation is required. Uh, for a second degree function, you will get a positive definite, which is the H. So you don't have to, again, calculate a step size, which is why it's computationally less expensive. And secondly, uh, because you're taking advantage of this Hessian, uh, you, you're, you're, using more inf you're using the information available also in the Hessian, which is a second degree differential to arrive at the direction of movement instead of uh, depending on some other method to calculate alpha. So you're going to uh, decrement your xi by this, uh, by this component, which we have talked about before, iteratively, and um, stop when convergence is reached. Convergence is typically defined as some point where you will not get any incremental uh, value in uh, iterating further. So that's basically about the Newton direction. Um, I'm going to skip all of this. Um, we have talked about this. Um, yeah, so basically, like I said, uh, gradient boosting can be looked at as a uh, combination of multiple additive models. So. For k iterations, you can look at it as uh, an addition of all these residual components where uh, alpha is uh, step size or uh, alpha is step size and uh, eta is uh, learning rate. Um, Uh, this is just an overview of how the uh, Hessian and gradient are calculated for different kind of loss functions, which are commonly used. Uh, this is the calculation for log loss. Uh, that's the calculation for uh, root mean square error, which is a regression problem. Log loss is used in classification problems, like I said. And um, I mean, all these are, I mean, available. Um, this is for uh, log loss. Yeah, so I'm going to stop here and uh, take any questions that you have. Hi, Mari. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions. and. Um, I'll just read them out. Um, Dave H has said, I thought bootstrapping is sampling with replacements. So I think there was a little confusion uh, when you had mentioned uh, regarding the bootstrapping in one of your very oh, early slides. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, my bad. Yes, a bootstrapping is sampling with replacement, which is why there's going to be overlap across samples, which we, we do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's sampling with replacement. Sorry. Now, there was another question um, by Naima Ahmed Nazragi. Uh, he says, when is cat boost and uh, I'm not sure how to say this, L-I-H-G-T-B-M preferred? Light GBM. Yeah, light GBM preferred. Like, when are these two preferred? Amy, I, I think he's referring to what business case or use case might be. Uh, so, uh, very unfortunately, there's no such thing called as a free lunch in machine learning. So, 
you really have to try out what works on your data because uh, all these are gradient based optimization techniques i mean all, all these are uh, gradient based boosting techniques so uh with a little difference in terms of the loss functions they use or in terms of the hyperparameters which they use but they're all uh, they're all, they all have fundamentally the same meta algorithm so uh it's it would be very difficult to know beforehand which one would work the better with your data you will have to try it out and see that's the only way um and uh, for some of the techniques there is also um you can also consider uh, the computational expensiveness in the sense i think some of them are computationally more expensive so if you have very large data then that could be a criteria to skip or choose a particular technique so there's nothing like uh, when you look at the particular use case you'll be able to understand right from the start that okay this is what i'm going to apply you have to try and it's a trial error matter yeah that's a very risky approach to know beforehand yeah um there's another question by upasana shukla does this work well on text analytics problems especially when we have unlabeled data um uh like i said at the start of this session uh, if you have uh, text uh, if you have textual data which is agnostic to any kind of labeling then uh, neural network based approaches would work better uh, because uh, that again is uh, one word is comparable to another uh, as an entity so you're dealing with homogeneous data which is why again a lot of nlp techniques are based on neural networks uh however uh, there are you could try out things like a bag of words where you would convert the occurrences of each word into feature vector and then try to feed it into the model on a related note would it work on data that is that has colors in it when we have rgb to actually uh, track down in it, image data you mean yes yes Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, you mean like, uh, acha. So you mean XGBoost for image data? You could try. You could try. Uh, you could try. But uh, I, I mean, I, I think that there are like really advanced neural networks available out there for uh, image data. So I wouldn't really like try and. Uh, when neural network uh, when alex net was first introduced i think the i think some boosted uh, some boosting uh, boosted tree was come um madhvi hello i think um, madhvi's uh, battery was low Uh, let's just give her a second or two. Is anybody able to see Madhavi besides? Can somebody just write a comment? No. I think her battery has. One moment, just a second. Thank you. So uh, I'm sorry, Devesh. Uh, you had one more question, and I gave lost Madhvi. I, I think I remember seeing her battery at thirty percent. Might have died, but we'll definitely reach out to her and uh, convey your question ahead. Just a second. I think she's back. I really apologize Hello? for that. I think my laptop, uh, my, my laptop went out of battery. So yeah, we yeah. guessed it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you were asking me a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you you did mention that we have uh, very advanced uh, neural networks for image data, and it would be best to go. Yeah, ahead. but boosted trees did come a close second, though, with uh, different sorts of. I think this was related to handwriting, if I'm not wrong. But yeah, I mean, they did come a close second, though. But uh, it, the performance is nowhere comparable to the kind of neural networks that you have today. Okay. So there's another question by Devesh. Um, I've tried checking feature importance. in simple decision trees how easy it is for xgboost yeah so uh, xgboost uh, so that's the trade off between a black box which is more accurate versus a more interpretable model which is not as accurate 
uh, XG Boost does give you uh, it does give you uh, some kind of variable importance, but uh, it's not as interpretable like uh, how you would expect it to be in case of uh, logistic regression or a decision tree. Uh, it, I think it's it, it's related to voting, uh, depending upon how many times a particular variable is used where the correct prediction has happened, uh, something along those lines. It does give it, you would be able to identify the order. Uh, probably you could look at top 10 or top 20, which are the most important predictors, but uh, you would not be able to uh, get more information beyond that, like... Um, you can't infer things like if this goes up, that goes down by X percent. That kind of interpretation is not possible. Um, there's one more question. What is F score for feature importance in uh, if it's based on XG boost? Do we have F scores for uh, whenever we are trying to, like, as you mentioned, we can try to find out feature importance, but do we have F scores for that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I think F score is used uh, in the context of uh, statistical analysis. If I'm not wrong, I, I'm, I don't think the concept applies here at all. I think he, he, we clarify saying um, by F score he meant the feature importance. Can we list based on our own evaluation? Okay, that's another question. I think. Uh, okay. So, okay. Fe feature importance. Uh, you do. I mean, uh, you do get the feature importance in a lot of implementations of XGBoost. At least in Python, I I know that it, it throws you the list of uh, it throws to the, it throws you the list of variables in the order of uh, importance. So you don't have to reevaluate it and interpret it on your own. But uh, yeah, specific interpretations like uh, yeah, specific quantification is not possible. So the, the there is it's it could be possible it could be based on AUPC or uh, AUPRC. Uh, yeah. By uh, your own metric evaluation methods, huh? He had mentioned an example called AUPRC. The uh, uh -huh. the ROC curve. But yeah. The precision recall curve. I am not exactly sure, but as you mentioned, we uh, yes, 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 he's confirmed it. Precision recall curve. Uh, that would be at an overall level for the model, I guess. Uh, that's I mean that is basically trying to arrive at the critical p value for classifying the variable as uh, one or zero. Uh, but I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm not entirely sure how that ties into importance of individual features used in the model as such. I hope that answers. There are no further questions. But uh, I would like to thank you once again for that. It was a really uh, elaborate session right from the beginning till exhibiting. So it's very informative. And I'm glad we have this recorded. So. Anybody else in the future can also look at it. And once again, thank you from the entire Wits Mumbai team. Thank you for joining us. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry about the goof up in between. Uh, but thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. you can email me your questions or uh, you can post it.